Hey guys, Mr. P here. This video is going to be all about carbon and how carbon cycles through organisms and their environment. So uh, carbon is one of those compounds or one of those elements rather that makes up a variety of organic compounds that are really, really important for both plants and animals, specifically producers and the consumers within an environment. But uh, carbon doesn't just or isn't just found in living things. Carbon is found in a variety of inorganic forms and uh, all of those inorganic forms are found throughout our environment and have to constantly cycle from the environment into living things before being returned back to the environment. And so this section is all about how to kind of fully understand what carbon's role is uh, and uh, what the carbon cycle really entails. And so to start, let's talk about what all these pictures kind of have in common. Now, obviously carbon is the base atom that we're talking about, and we really can't have a carbon cycle without it. Carbon is an atom that contains four valence electrons, which means it needs to bond up to four times in order to fill its outer energy shell. And so because it has the ability to uh, form four bonds, uh, it, it also has the ability to form bonds with a variety of other elements. And so carbon has kind of um, created a niche, so to speak, of organic compounds uh, that contain not only carbon, but hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen and phosphorus. And so it gave rise, or it has given rise, to a variety of organic compounds that make up all of the living tissues found on the planet. And so carbon as an atom makes up larger compounds, which obviously are going to make up the living tissues, not only found in plants, but also found in animals. And so at the base level, and something that you will see kind of throughout this lecture is that plants are going to use or pull in atmospheric carbon in the form of CO2, carbon dioxide, it's going to turn this inorganic form of carbon in the form of carbon dioxide into an organic form of carbon, which is glucose, not only to use the glucose within itself, but also as a means of feeding consumers. And so you will see as we get into a more detailed in-depth discussion of the carbon cycle, that atmospheric or carbon will cycle from the atmosphere uh, kind of through carbon dioxide into plant biomass, which obviously uh, makes the base of every food chain, ultimately kind of coming into the consumers, which will take the energy and the carbon to higher trophic levels before uh, eventually plants and animals die. That carbon obviously returned into CO2 through decomposition, which will be released back to the atmosphere. And so you can see already we have kind of initially started the carbon cycle. You can see that it ends and starts with the atmosphere uh, or within the environment and cycles through living things on its way. But we need to get into a more in-depth discussion. Uh, this is a skill that the IB requires you to know. And so let's talk about really what the carbon cycle is. The carbon cycle uh, has a variety of forms. Okay, So we're going to see some inorganic forms. We're going to see some organic forms. Carbon dioxide, as we already discussed, is an inorganic form. Okay, Carbon dioxide is CO2. It does not contain hydrogen and so therefore is inorganic. Glucose is organic, that is C6H12O6, containing carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, making it uh, organic. Organismal biomass would be both plant and animal. Obviously, that would be organic as well. That's what makes up the mass of the uh, organisms. And then fossil fuels is a a, a non-renewable resource, which is really carbon, uh, is carbon-based, but is really carbon-dense in a lot of situations. And so fossil fuels can be both or all peat, coal, oil, natural gas, uh, stuff like that. So carbon cycle is going to contain all four of these elements, and the carbon will cycle through all four of these elements in a variety of capacities. Um, and so you can kind of already see this diagram. This one's a little kind of trickier to understand, and so I like to simplify it a little bit. Again, this is a skill, constructed diagram of the carbon cycle, and so these are five different sinks, meaning sources of carbon. Uh, 
We have CO2 in the atmosphere, carbon in producers, carbon in consumers, carbon in dead organic matter, and then carbon in fossil fuels. And so how do we link all of these together and what are the processes that will link all of these? And so I think the carbon cycle should be depicted as follows. Notice that the yellow things that we just talked about, okay, these yellow boxes are what we call sinks. They're sources of carbon. They're where carbon is stored. And then we will see a variety of purple arrows, which is the way in which the carbon flows from sink to sink. So we have sinks or places where carbon is stored, and we have processing that takes place that uh, transfers carbon from one form to another, okay? And so how does CO2 in the atmosphere, obviously in the form of carbon dioxide, get into the producers? And we know that process to be photosynthesis. Photosynthesis has been described in previous videos as well. Uh, photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide and water in addition to light and produces carbon-based compounds, specifically glucose, for producers to uh, basically feed themselves with. Okay, now, can producers put CO2 back into the atmosphere? And the answer is yes, they go through cell respiration as well. Um, consumers, like humans, are not the only organisms that do cell respiration. In fact, plants are kind of often misinterpreted or misjudged or, or misunderstood um, by a lot of people. And so they think that plants are only going to do photosynthesis or that plants are only, it is only possible for plants to do photosynthesis. And in fact, they do both. Plants photosynthesize to produce glucose, but then have to respire cellularly to break that glucose down to produce usable uh, amounts of ATP. Okay, so plants are kind of simultaneously going to pull CO2 out of the environment and also put it back. Now, what is another way carbon in the producers will return back to the atmosphere? And that is through combustion, uh, specifically if we cut down a tree and we burned the biomass or we burned the wood, we would be combusting. That would be a combustion reaction and we would be releasing carbon in the form of carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. Okay. Now, how do or how does carbon get from producers to consumers? That is through consumption. Consumers have to feed, specifically primary consumers, and we've talked about these terms before, but primary consumers are going to feed on producers. We call those herbivores. It is possible, though, and happens, that consumers will release the carbon they just got from the producers through consumption. They will release that carbon back to the atmosphere, and again, we call that cell respiration. Okay, Consumers and producers have to go through cell respiration to produce usable uh, amounts of ATP. That is the purpose of cell respiration. Now, consumers feed on each other, okay? Primary consumers obviously feed on producers, but then you have secondary consumers that feed on primary consumers. Third level consumers are gonna consume second level consumers and fourth level consumers will consume the third level consumers. And so through feeding, Different trophic levels, different levels of consumers will feed on each other. Again, that transfers carbon to future trophic levels or higher trophic levels. Producers and consumers both die. And so through death, the consumers and producers, the carbon in them will return or at least go into this sink called uh, the carbon that is basically in dead organic matter. Then saprotrophs or the fungus bacteria mushrooms stuff like that will release the carbon in dead organic matter back to the atmosphere through their cell respiration processes again that requires decomposers to do but ultimately decomposers are decomposing the dead organic matter to um, return the carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere and it's good because it just helps to cycle the carbon Again, now, the carbon that is in the producers and consumers for that matter, matter can and do go undecomposed. So obviously, if the producers die and are going to be decomposed, they head this way before being released back to the atmosphere. But in some um, anaerobic conditions, 
the carbon that is in the producer level goes undecomposed. And so <clears throat> if there is an incomplete or um, a, a stoppage in the decomposition or the fossilization of the producers, then the carbon gets stored in this big sink that we call fossil fuels for potential later combustion, uh, which we burn in order to produce energy. And that energy will use, you know, it, it'll gain us a usable form of energy, usually in the form of electricity, but we do in, in turn release CO2 back to the atmosphere. Okay, so hopefully you can see uh, the variety of sinks and flows that are available in our environment and how carbon ultimately flows from atmosphere through uh, organic compounds in living things, uh, ultimately before being released back to the atmosphere. So where is the carbon in aquatic ecosystems? Carbon dioxide concentrations um, atmospherically or atmospheric CO2 concentrations are going to greatly influence uh, what happens to aquatic ecosystems. Uh, in a future le lecture, we'll talk more in depth about ocean acidification and coral reef bleaching. However, uh, right now, we just need to kind of talk about what carbon's role in aquatic ecosystems is. Uh, and so we know that, that carbon dioxide is abundant in the atmosphere. We know that it is one of the components of our air that we breathe, plants use it, we release it uh, every time we exhale but some of that CO2 will directly dissolve into the water and when it does it will combine with the water in order to produce a compound called carbonic acid. Now carbonic acid as we'll learn in a later lecture like I said uh, will obviously lower the pH of the water but it's not just the carbonic acid that will lower the pH it's the uh, creation or the release of these H plus ions from the carbonic acid that actually has a greater influence on the pH of the water. Uh, more of that to come uh, in a future lecture. But both dissolved carbon dioxide and the hydrogen carbonate ions are absorbed by aquatic plants and other autotrophs that live in the water. And so uh, this is basically our aquatic carbon source. And so aquatic plants, uh, algae, uh, aquatic vegetation, all are going to kind of absorb these uh, carbon-based compounds to use in its aquatic-based photosynthesis, um, which obviously is going to kind of form the base of the aquatic food chains. Okay, H plus ions, as I explained, um, are going to kind of reduce the pH of the water and make the water more acidic. Again, more of that to come. So carbon dioxide is produced by cellular respiration and diffuses out of organisms into water or the atmosphere depending on if the organisms are aquatic or terrestrial. We know uh, from uh, previous videos that the mitochondria is the organelle that is responsible for uh, ATP creation. Obviously this ATP will be created in large amounts. That is the goal of cellular respiration. Obviously, glycolysis is the first step. The TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle would be kind of the second step with a, um, a prep step linking the first glycolysis and the second TCA cycle. But also, the electron transport and chemiosmosis would be the third step before ultimately large amounts of ATP are made. You will notice, though, that CO2, and hopefully you appreciate from previous lectures, that CO2 and water vapor are the byproducts of cellular respiration and so will be released to the atmosphere. Every time we exhale, we are releasing um, carbon dioxide and water that are carrying low energy electrons that we kind of squeezed out of some intermediate molecules um, on our way of producing these ATP molecules. But ultimately that carbon is gonna be kind of released from our food back to the environment through the cellular respiration pathway. That is in both plants and animals that undergo this uh, cell respiration pathway. Now, when we talk about plants and we talk specifically photosynthesis, we know that carbon dioxide actually diffuses from the atmosphere um, or the water, if it's, a, if it's an aquatic plant, into the autotrophs. And so you'll see that CO2 in this case actually goes in. And we don't need to talk the specifics about the, the, the cross-section here, but basically CO2 will go in through these pores in the bottom of the leaf, which are the stomata, and will enter this, this kind of palisade mesophyll layer, which is where the majority of the photosynthetic activity takes place. Obviously, the carbon dioxide will be converted into those glucose molecules that we've talked about, which is the role of um, photosynthesis.
before releasing a byproduct which in photosynthesis case is oxygen. Now, once glucose will be made uh, by the plants, they will be burned um, using the cell respiration pathway by both the plants that produce the glucose, but also by animals that eat the plants, and eventually we ultimately get the CO2 released back to the atmosphere. So, peat. Peat is a, uh, a really carbon energy rich, um, waterlogged, kind of waterlogged soil. Um, it is found in a variety of wetlands, such as mires and bogs, but the key kind of takeaway on the type of environment that is conducive to peat formation is that it needs to be waterlogged, meaning it needs to have a large concentration or a high concentration of water um, for a variety of reasons, and we'll talk about that. Peat is very dark, and that's because it is really, really nutrient-dense. Um, and only certain types of vegetation can grow on its surface, such as sphagnum moss. 30% of its dried mass must be composed of dead organic matter in order for it to be actually considered peat. And soil that uh, forms peat is called histosol, and a layer of peat is typically between 10 and 40 centimeters thick. Where are the peat lands uh, that, that kind of cover the Earth's surface? They are typically in these areas that you can see that are dark in this diagram. Obviously, the northern... Um, kind of the, the most northern of the northern hemisphere is where the majority of the peat lands are contained on the planet, but there is a, a pretty dense peat field right here in the Philippines. So um, what are some of the conditions that are uh, needed? Um, we'll get to that, but peat is a highly effective carbon sink, and it is estimated that the world's peat contains 550 gigatons of carbon. That is a substantial amount of carbon that is literally stored in the ground right now. We call that a sink. We just talked about what sinks mean, right? It's a source of carbon. It's a source of storage, carbon storage. And as we harvest the peat and burn the peat as a non-renewable resource, because we can gain energy from it, we will essentially be releasing all 550 gigatons um, of carbon dioxide or of carbon back into the atmosphere, which obviously would, would raise our carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. So a little bit more about peat formation. The high levels of water, you can see that these peat lands are very saturated with moisture, and it, it must be that way because the high levels of water on peat lands force out all of the air that would typically be between the soil particles as a result um, of the way soil is typically packed into a ground, but because it is so waterlogged, it forces the air out. And because the air has been forced out, it creates anaerobic conditions. We know that anaerobic means without oxygen. It means, uh, it makes total sense. If we put water into the soil and basically kind of keep the soil waterlogged, it's gonna force the air out, which in turn forces oxygen out, uh, contributing to anaerobic conditions. Since the conditions are anaerobic, it's only going to allow certain microorganisms to grow. Um, and if we prevent the normal microorganisms and fungus from doing the normal decomposition, then it's going to leave behind most of what would have been decomposed, which is why it's so nutrient dense. Okay, The majority or the 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 majority of the decomposition that should have happened isn't allowed to happen. And so over time, these molecules are transformed into energy-rich peat. Since the environment is anaerobic, the pH of the soil remains very acidic as well. And uh, the anaerobic conditions mixed with or in addition to the very acidic conditions means that the decomposition process by these microbes is inhibited even further. So you basically have microorganisms and fungus that want to decompose all of these kind of dead organic nutrients but can't because of the anaerobic and very acidic conditions. And because we have those anaerobic and acidic conditions, it is inhibiting the, the, the microbes from growing and they can't do their normal thing. And so the, the carbon goes undigested, undecomposed, and it just sits there in this sink that we call peat. In order for it to be used as a fuel, we have to cut the peat into either like slabs, granules, blocks, and we have to let it dry out because we can't burn something that is very like um, moisture. Um, you know, we can't burn something that has a very high moisture content. So 
Uh, we have to move it to where it goes, we need to dry it out, and we cannot um, readily make this. It is considered a non-renewable energy source because it is kind of naturally made, but it takes a really, really long time to form, uh, much like natural gas, coal, oil, and stuff like that. Okay, Those are natural, uh, naturally made uh, non-renewable resources. They do have a lot of energy contained within them. We can burn them as a viable energy source for electricity production, but it takes a long time, and so it's just not very conducive um, as a long-term solution. So, how is coal, coal, how is coal and oil formed? Well, basically, you form peat first. Peat is formed kind of very quickly um, in in comparison to coal and oil, but once you form that peat, which is very close to the surface, and then over time you deposit more and more and more and more and more sediment, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper, which in increases the heat and increases the pressure over time. And if you have a long period of time with high pressure and high heat, you eventually turn that peat, which is really energy rich, into an even more concentrated, really energy rich, uh, even darker compound that we know to be coal and oil, okay? Um, obviously, we know from our history that we typically use coal and oil uh, to burn. We combust it. Um, we, we put it through a combustion reaction, and we gain electricity as a result of its burning. But uh, because it is really, really packed with carbon, when we burn it, it is releasing or will release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, which is why the burning of fossil fuels uh, leads to an increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide. How do we get to the oil and uh, natural gas and coal that is obviously buried deep within the ground? We have to drill and mine for it. Oil and natural gas formation occurred in ancient oceans. It basically was uh, covered up with sediment and uh, it got kind of pushed into these kind of oil and coal beds. And so we need to extract it via mining and drilling in areas where it collected together to produce um, kind of a productive reservoir. Okay. Um, carbon dioxide is produced when fossil fuels and biomass are used. It doesn't matter if we're burning wood, which would be kind of uh, straight biomass. It doesn't matter if we're burning peat. It doesn't matter if we're burning um, oil or natural gas or coal. It will all produce carbon dioxide okay one of the products of combustion is that co2 is released carbon is found in the things that we're burning and when we burn it we are releasing the carbon in the form of carbon dioxide okay ethanol has been kind of designed to be a um, or has been determined to be a a, a renewable viable option uh, in, in the form of biofuels, and so the process of producing a biofuels to cut down on the number of fossil fuels that are being uh, burned, or at least cutting down on the quantity of bio, uh, the quantity of uh, fossil fuels that are being burned, uh, we can produce ethanol as an alternative energy source, and the way that we do that is we have to put biomass, usually in the form of maybe algae, or corn husks or different uh, soybean husks that we that we produce uh, for a food source anyway we have to put it through a pretreatment um, the pretreatment typically uh, creates this hemicellulose and lignin that are separated from the uh, the really kind of um, structural molecule known as cellulose. So plants have cellulose, which adds the structural integrity to the cell wall. We have to break the cellulose down into the hemicellulose and the lignin. That's the purpose of the pretreatment. Okay, pretreatment, breaking that down, makes it a more usable form of energy uh, in order to hydrolyze with our enzymes. Okay, so we then put it through a hydrolysis reaction, which is going to depolymerize, meaning it's going to take our polymer and it's going to break it down. And it's going to produce fermentable sugars, which are, which are pentose and glucose. Now, pentose is a five carbon sugar and glucose is a six carbon sugar, but both of these are monosaccharides. And so those are usable sugars by bacteria 
um, or specifically yeast that will produce our ethanol for us. And so we have to make this, um, this really high polysaccharide, this really big densely packed polysaccharide into fermentable sugars that our yeast cells can use. Once they utilize these uh, monosaccharide sugars, they can produce alcohol, uh, specifically ethanol. So ethanol is produced. And then we have to separate and purify the ethanol to be mixed or cut with the gasoline, which is obviously still a fossil fuel. But by adding biofuels into uh, the, the fossil fuels, the straight gasoline, we are actually able to decrease the amount of gasoline that we're burning per tank of gas, which hopefully makes a big impact long term. Okay. Um, one other thing that we need to talk about, which isn't really related to carbon and carbon cycling, is the idea of methanogens. Methanogens are um, living agents that produce methane. Okay. Now, the reason methane is included is methane is still a carbon-based compound. Okay, methane happens to be CH4, whereas CO2, for instance, um, you know, is a different compound, different molecule, but methane is still carbon-based and therefore still cycles, uh, still, you know, plays into this idea of carbon cycle. Um, these methanogens are microbes that produce methane. They live in anaerobic conditions, which typically means when we talk about methanogens is that they live in guts of or digestive tracts of mammals including humans um, and livestock okay we have a lot of livestock on our planet we obviously harvest cows for a, a big component of our food production but with large herd of, herds of cattle being raised worldwide there are concerns that the quantities of methane they produce are contributing to the greenhouse effect one of the biggest um, most widely understood hypotheses surrounding greenhouse effect and global warming is the idea of uh, of herding cattle and uh, raising cattle for food production. If all of these cattle have large numbers of methanogens in their guts and in their digestive tract, as well as humans, I mean the human population continues to grow. If the human population continues to grow and we are needing more and more uh, beef or more and more beef production than the number of cows that we herd um, obviously grows and so with all of these methanogens we're uh, we're creating more and more methane which is obviously leading to you know in their mind uh, a bigger global warming issue uh, again global warming and climate change is going to be the topic of the next video but uh, for now we just kind of need to know what methanogens are doing methanogens are releasing car uh, a carbon-based compound known as methane into the um, into the environment. Now, what does methane do once it gets into the environment? Methane, which is CH4, is going to mix with O2, which is obviously readily available in our environment, and it's going to produce water vapor and carbon dioxide. Now, water vapor and carbon dioxide are both greenhouse gases. Um, they both have the ability to absorb heat and radiate heat in all directions. Okay. Um, they can both absorb infrared radiation, that's the, the long wave radiation, which obviously we're going to talk about in uh, future videos as well. But you can see that a actually methane contributions have been increasing steadily since 1985, obviously through 2015. And so you can see that if you put a trend line in here, there is a, a, a nice linear straight increase in the actual concentration in parts per billion. Again, that is a good distinction. Carbon dioxide is uh, is measured in parts per million okay so methane concentrations are much less than carbon dioxide but uh, methane is still a viable um, heat absorber and heat radiator and so it still needs to be uh, talked about when we talk about the carbon cycle as well as global change okay it is estimated that on average methane persists in the atmosphere for 8.4 years that obviously um, means that when a molecule of methane is released into the atmosphere it will stay viable in the atmosphere for you know over eight years so eight years worth of heating um, to our environment uh, for every methane molecule produced measurements indicate that the level of atmospheric methane are increasing we've kind of said that overall okay um, that's possibly due to an increase in human um, population numbers it could be you know, more fossil fuel burning, 
It could be a mixture of the two. Obviously, as more people are produced, uh, we have to burn more fossil fuels because we have to heat more and more homes. We have to drive and transport people you know, farther distances, and, and there's just more cars on the road. So atmospheric carbon dioxide uh, concentrations obviously have been increasing as well. One thing that I want you to key in on is when you look at this line, you will notice that it is increasing pretty rapidly, but the red line you will see that there are annual fluctuations and so if we actually zoom in to one of these little annual fluctuations you will see that in the northern hemisphere uh, at least for us through winter into early uh, like spring our co2 concentration is increasing and that is because there is less plant biomass because the trees have lost their leaves um, it's colder, plants aren't photosynthesizing, and so the global CO2 concentration is increasing. However, when you hit spring and you go into summer through early fall, which is this uh, section, you have all the leaves on the trees, you have a lot of plant biomass, you have warm temperatures, and so CO2 levels fall because the plants are actually using the carbon dioxide and are pulling it out of the atmosphere and are storing it in their biomass. But then when the temperatures decrease and the plants uh, lose their leaves in fall, you will see that the uh, the the peak, you know, basically uh, CO2 concentration increases for the next year or the next peak. Okay, so peaks indicate the winters, the troughs indicate the summer. Again, this is in the northern hemisphere, that's where we live, and so... Um, that's why this line looks so jaggedy. But the trend overall, if you looked you know, at a trend line, it is that the trend is the carbon dioxide concentration as measured by uh, the carbon dioxide station in Mauna Loa is increasing overall. Okay. Um, again, we're going to finish uh, or follow this lecture up with another one, uh, specifically talking about carbon dioxide and methane's role in climate change, as well as what happens to uh, our oceans as carbon dioxide concentrations increase. It obviously is going to lead to a condition known as ocean acidification, which will lead to uh, coral reef bleaching. It's a bad problem. We'll talk about it. Bye.